Boim, Bruchim Aboim. The uh, sto- the uh, topic this week is something near and dear to my heart: stories. Um, it's interesting because I, I remember when I uh, decided to become religious, much like college. I was trying to figure out what I should major in, and I found that you major in nothing and you minor in everything. And much to my surprise. I found out that I have a certain talent in telling stories. If you've been listening to my lectures all through the time, you've heard story after story. And I never realized it. I mean, in the secular world, we read books, but we don't really tell stories. And if we do, it's usually to children. You know, you don't go out to dinner and then someone says to you, okay, now it's story time. And yet, when I, especially Friday night, when I go to a Shabbos dinner, then people will turn to me and ask me to tell a story. And it's really very strange. And the question is, why, where and why? Where does this come from and why? Why do we tell stories? And it's interesting that if you look into the Torah, the five books of Moses, and into the Mishnah, into the Talmud, the Gemara, and even to the prophets, what you find is stories all over the place, one story after another. And yet... What we have is the 613 commandments and thousands of rabbinic commandments on top of that. Judaism is really a religion of do's and don'ts, positive commandments, negative commandments, things you're supposed to do, things you shouldn't do. And in fact, the book of Vayikra, the middle book, and that's really kind of what the majority is about things we're supposed to do and not supposed to do. So why tell stories? All God had to do is just give us an instruction manual that says this is what you do, this is what you don't do, and that's the end of it. And in fact, it's interesting that the whole book of Beratius, for the most part, there are really no direct commandments given to the Jewish nation. They don't begin until the third sedra, Bo, in the book of Shmos, the second book. And the question is, why? And... Why does the Torah bother? And, and, and what we look here is stories about really superstars. Adam, first man, again, who was born with all this knowledge. And then with Avraham and Yitzchak and Yaakov and their sons and the sale of Yosef. And what we see is that even illustrious people through the stories make mistakes. And through the stories, we are taught lessons you know, when someone tells you something and he makes a point and he comes and tells you something and he wants you to learn and then he repeats it again <laughs> and then he repeats it a third time, you get a bit impatient and you think he must think that I'm a bit dense or stupid. Why do he say it three times? On the other hand, if a person comes to you and tells you something and then tells you a story and then explains the story, you have absolutely no problem with what he did. In fact, you may even be interested. And he's told it to you three times. The reason I became a storyteller is the first story that I was told. It's a famous story called The King in the Field. It was during the month of El, just before, a month before the high holidays. And there's a famous story of a man, of a king, who went out for the hunt, to hunt deer. And while he was out with his entourage of people that were, of course, company a king, he saw a magnificent buck. And without thinking about anything, he took off at a gallop, chasing the buck. And somehow, the hunting party didn't realize that the king had bolted away. And the king didn't notice that he was by himself. And he chases this buck into the forest, deeper and deeper into the forest. And finally, he loses the buck. He's just so dense, he can't see the buck. And he looks around and he realizes he's all by himself. And he's a king and not used to being in the forest by himself. But he's by a stream. And he's a bit thirsty. They started early in the day. And he dismounts. And as he goes over to the stream to get some water, all of a sudden, his horse neighs and rears, 
and takes off at a gallop. And he looks and there's a bear. <laughs> and the king takes off also. And what the king does, instead of running out of the forest, runs deeper into the forest. And all of the bushes and low-hanging trees start tearing on the king's clothing. And the king's tired and the king's hungry. And the sun's starting to set. And the king wonders, what's he going to do alone in the forest? The king. And as the sun sets and it becomes dark, he sees in the distance some light. And he becomes very hopeful. And he walks towards the light and he comes to the cabin of a woodsman. And he knocks lightly on the door. And the woodsman opens the door and he looks. And standing in front of him is a pitiful sight. The king, with all of his clothes tattered, bruised, and looking totally, not just physically lost, but weary. And he invites the king into his humble hut. And he says to the king, please sit. But he says, it's not much of a chair, just a log that I have. And I'm sorry, I know, you're used to sitting on a throne. And the king says, that's fine, thank you, a log's just fine. And he says to the king, I'm sure that you're hungry and thirsty, but all I have is moldy bread, and I have goat's milk, and all I have is this one cup, not so clean. And the king smiles at the woodsman, and he says, you know what, moldy bread and goat's milk in a not so clean cup would just fine. And after he had his meal, if you can call it that, the woodsman says to the king, I'm sure that you're very tired, I can see that. But all I have, I know you're used to sleeping on fine linens and goose down, but all I have is rags, I have straw, and I put rags on top of it in an old blanket. And the king smiled and he says, you know what, straw on boards with, an old, with, a, with rags and an old blanket be just perfect. And the woodsman gets it ready for him. The king's asleep before he even lays down. And early in the morning, as the sun's coming up, the woodsman takes the king and he leads him to the edge of the forest. And you can imagine that there were all kinds of search parties looking for the king. And when they come to a clearing at the edge of the forest, they see the king and they quickly grab the king. And the woodsman's not even seen. And they take the king back to, the for back to his palace. And the woodsman goes back to his hut. And the next day, there's a commotion of the birds in the forest making a chatter. And through the forest comes a carriage with six horses and an armed guard with it, with the captain of the guard. And the woodsman can hear this. Then he hears a bang on the door. And he opens the door. And there stands, with his regality, the captain of the guard. And he says, the king wants to see you. You're to present yourself before the king. And the woodsman says, of course. Why wouldn't the king? They're going to cut my head off. After all, who has a king sit on a board? And who feeds a king moldy bread and goat's milk in a dirty cup? And who gives a king to sleep on boards with straw and shmatas and a dirty blanket? Of course, they're coming to arrest me and they're going to execute me. And I deserve it. And the, and the captain opens the door to the carriage. The woodsman goes in and sits in tears because he knows his end is shortly to come. And they come to the palace and they walk the woodsman in. And there's the king with all his regality sitting on the throne. And when he sees the woodsman, the woodsman falls to his knees. And the king rushes over to the woodsman and picks him up and hugs him and kisses him. And the woodsman's besides himself. He said, I thought you came, I came to be executed. He says, executed? He says, I, come to, I brought you here to thank you. You saved my life. He said, but I gave you all those things. He said, you don't understand. At that point, that was, more, that was what I needed. You took care of me. And because of that, I'm going to take care of you the rest of your life. And during El, during that time before Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, it says that God is in the field. Just like a president when he's on the road trying to be elected. He wants to shake your hand more than you want to shake his. My father, we rest in peace, shook Reagan's hand. 
he was thrilled. And I think Reagan was thrilled. Because <laughs> that's, that's exactly, go try to shake a president's hand when he's not running for election. You're not going to get that close. But when he's on the campaign trail, that's exactly what he wants to do. He wants to shake as many hands as he can. And God, during that month of El, like the king in the field, is approachable. Where during the rest of the year, it's very hard to get to him. When he's in the forest, then just like the king, that little bit of things, that little mitzvah that you do, makes a difference. And this rabbi gave a whole lecture. And in that lecture, I have no idea what he said before. I have no idea what his conclusion was. And I can't tell you. If you put a gun to my head, I wouldn't be able to say it. But I do remember one thing, this story. Because it was so powerful and said so well that it stayed with me for 30 years. And that becomes the key that when a person hears a story, especially when it's told to him in that venue, it's not, it's, it, it, it's not threatening. Remember my daughter, I've told the story, had a friend come over and we put up a sukkah together. And my kids used to joke around about all the answers I say religiously. They knew everything. And when she brought her friend over and we, we were talking about the sukkah, her friend had no religious background. And I explained to her all the things, symbolism, whatever. When her friend left, my daughter turned to me and said, it was wonderful what you told her. And I start laughing. She says, no, really. I said, you know all those answers. What do you mean? It was wonderful. She said, it sounded different when you told someone else. And that's the key. That sometimes the way to touch someone is to tell them, tell someone else, and then they listen. Esau listened when, Yaakov told, when Yitzhak told Yaakov to get a, new, a wife from someone other than the common, and then he went and married another wife from Yishmael. When we tell stories, those stories have the ability to make us better. You know, I always tell people, there were two guys who worked for a man, one had worked for three years, one had worked for 10. And the man who had worked for 10 years happened to see the, three guys, the man who worked for three years, his paycheck. He was making more money than him. He went to the boss and he said, come on, I've worked with you for 10 years. He's only been here three. He's making more money than me? And the, the boss said, wait one second, stand aside. He called the guy to work three years over. He says, Harry. You know, he's told him first, the guy was working for him for 10 years. There's a guy in the corner selling oranges. Find out how much one orange is. Comes back, he says, a dime. Now go back and find out how much a dozen oranges is. He comes back, he says, a dollar. But now he sends him back and says, find out how much a case of oranges are. He comes back and says, a case of oranges is $5. And he says, watch. And he calls the guy who's only been working three years. He says, Harry, there's a guy in the corner there selling oranges. Find out how much one orange is. Harry comes back and he says, one orange is a, is a dime, a dozen is a dollar, and a case is five. And the boss turned to him and says, that's why he's making more money. It's so powerful. Stories. They tell people what they need to hear. Because in a story, without calling someone foolish without calling someone silly, without calling someone stupid. You can make a point and you don't insult the person and sometimes the person actually listens and that becomes the key. You know, stories make us better. They teach us morals. They give us inspiration. They give us direction. They give us strength to know that someone else can do it. It's interesting, Beryl Wind is a historian, and he tells stories about great rabbis. And what he says is, I can't verify all these stories are true, but there's a flavor why these stories are told about these people. And from what's told about them and the sacrifices and the difficulties and the fact that they're able to succeed when we read in the Torah, about all that the forefathers went through and they still persevered. The fact that Basia stuck out her hand though it was impossible and somehow was able to grab Moshe's cradle. It teaches us all that we need to know. Those stories teach us much, much more than do this and don't do that. It's boring. Stories that we want to be like the forefathers. We want to be, reach that type of grace, at least strive for it. But it gives us, these stories give us wisdom. These stories give us hope. But most of all, all the stories in the Torah 
make us and help us to come closer to God Almighty, to be able to serve him better, and to find that love that's within us to connect, with the love that's above us to make that connection so that we can be servants of God, we can get closer to our Father in heaven. Again, thank you for coming. God bless and have a great Shabbos.